Good morning and welcome. Thanks to all of you who rose early on a Sunday morning to join us. I'm Andrea Spindle, Executive Director of the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. If anyone had told me that my retirement years would be spent fighting for the safety of the Jewish community in Canada and suffering along with all of us the pain and angst of worrying about Jews globally, I would not have believed it. CAF was founded in 2004 by Shirley Ann Haber, who one might, have thought, might think now was prescient, as she spoke tirelessly about rising anti-Semitism in Canada. I heard her speak at Jewish venues where she was jeered by denialists and by those who felt she was only stoking fear. I went to all of the organization's public speaker events and wrote letters, as Shirley Ann recommended, to all levels of government, asking that they address the concerns of our community. Today, this is about engagement. You're here because you already know the seriousness of anti-Semitism on the streets, in our educational institutions, in media, and in government. What I didn't see until 2019 when I joined CAF was that my generation of social science grads was a huge contributor to this phenomenon of radical education, critical race theory, and de-schooling, thus awakening the sleeping beast, wokeism. I'm a product of the 1960s sociology graduating classes that studied Herbert Marcuse, Paulo Freire, Franz Fanon, Saul Alinsky, Noam Chomsky, Ivan Illich, and others, thus unleashing social ideas on an unsuspecting public. Today we'll hear from experts, writers, lawyers, educators, and activists who are tackling the paradigm of critical race theory, its application in diversity, equity, and inclusion, policies, training, and brainwashing, and all the nuances and outright demonization of Jews and Israel that result from it. It's our hope that you will learn how to confront it, suppress, or destroy it. You'll have an opportunity at the end of the day to, or at the end of each panel to ask a few questions of our guests and at the end of the day to purchase the book by David Bernstein who's here with us today. I'm so thrilled to share a podium with him. On Woke Antisemitism, How Progressive Ideology Harms the Jews. Please note that we have a very tight schedule so please follow the program and um, take your break when it's given at 11.30 and get back here promptly at 12.00. We have a school bell that you would have noticed, and it'll ring five minutes ahead of time to get you back to your seats. I have two other short announcements as the person responsible for housekeeping here. Um, one is to ask that if anybody in the room has family members that had any direct contact with the dreadful school outing that led to this anti-Israel protest the other day to please see Michael Tepper, who's right here, He's the Vice President of CEF. He's a lawyer. We're gathering information. If anybody can share any, please see Michael. And I also want to share that CAF is honoring Rob Roberts, the Editor-in-Chief of the National Post, on October the 15th, as he heads a team that produces amazingly honest and truthful stories about Israel, anti-Semitism, and the Jewish world, and we invite you all to purchase a ticket and come and join us. And then lastly, if you don't know where the washrooms are, go past Eisenberg's and to the right. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. What great partners to have in Canada. Um, also, I want to thank um, Sam Goldstein and David Steinberg, who are my partners in all this, and you'll be hearing from both of them uh, today. Um, I'm David Bernstein. I'm founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values and author of Woke Antisemitism, How a Progressive Ideology Harms Jews. We are here today to discuss how a radical ideology that has swept through our institutions in North America and beyond has generated antisemitism and what to do about it. The ideology I speak of simplistically divides people into oppressed and oppressors by virtue of their identity. It insinuates itself into institutions and shuts down alternative points of view. And as we've seen in no uncertain terms since October 7th, 
It provides a permission structure for extremists, particularly extremists from the Muslim world, to target Jews. It's an ideology that signals to teachers that it's OK to take Toronto school kids dressed up as colonizers to an anti-Israel protest. What distinguishes the approach to fighting anti-Semitism we are talking about today in today's program from the typical mainstream approach is that we believe fighting anti-Semitism is not enough. We believe we need to not just fight the outward manifestations that are of Jew hatred, but to combat the underlying ideology that produces it. And so we will be emphasizing in each panel discussion what taking on this ideology actually looks like. Our hope is that this conference will gener generate a groundswell of support for a strategy for countering anti-Semitism and radical ideology that stands up for Western democratic values in Canada, the US, and beyond as a bulwark against these dangerous forces that tear the fabric of our society apart and put the Jewish community at risk. And with that, let's go get going with our first panel discussion that I've been very excited about. Uh, Barbara Kay and Jonathan Kay, come up here. Uh, they're, they're both prominent writers and thinkers, and uh, I know Barbara Kay, I've known Barbara's work since, I don't know, decades, I think. Um, and I've been, centuries, <laughs> centuries I've been reading you, Barbara. And, um, and Jonathan, uh, I've gotten to know through being an editor at Quillette Magazine, which is this unbelievably important journal that was formed in, what, 2013? Right. Uh, thank you for pronouncing it correctly. We, we get all kinds of pronunciations. Yeah, I think I misspelled it at some point, but it is. No, no, it's, it's a great. As long as you pronounce it correctly. It's a it's a great publication. It really was one of the first publications that sort of broke from this uh, ideological consensus and took it on. And and I I remember first reading articles in it and I thought to myself, wow, finally somebody is writing articles that challenge this ideology. And it was really well, that was. First, I saw that, so I couldn't be more appreciative. Before we, we I, I asked them each to go and give some opening remarks, though. Um, you know, Barbara, um, for anybody who knows Jonathan, we sort of know that he's got, I don't know, shall we say, an iconoclastic temperament. Um, and um, that had to manifest itself growing up. I mean, he. Yes, I just yes, have it to did. Right, yes. how, did, how did this event become this? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I know exactly. Proof. Is this on? Proof. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, we were his first icons, his parents. Uh, Is this an intervention? And so we were. <laughs> it's an intervention. Isn't it's an it? intervention. Again, I, I'm why sorry, does this always happen? Yeah. It's just like Passover. You have to admit this is a. You have to admit this is a great ruse that we got all these people together. <laughs> He does have an iconoclastic temperament, um, uh, and it did manifest itself very early. Uh, so it was sometimes challenging to, um, and he was very smart, and he is very smart, and a lot smarter than me. Uh, and he often outsmarted me even when he was young. So <laughs> I resent that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, he, uh, he has this interesting temperament, and, and he is a quirky fellow, but it all came together uh, in his career, I, I'm thrilled to see that um, he is now doing what I think he was born to do at Quillette and having a great time when he isn't playing uh, disc golf or board games or you know other stuff like that. Great. Well, then, Barbara, why don't you start and give us okay. some, some remarks. Thank you. So I should take this or I use the... Uh, It's really a great pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm uh, very grateful to David for inviting me, I, uh, and I'm honored uh, to be here. I, I know that October 7th has had a stunning impact on every sentient Jew in the diaspora. We are all shocked on several different levels, and I'm going to just touch briefly on four that I think uh, take in the, uh, sort of the umbrella of, uh, of our shock. So on a personal level, one, on a personal level, we have either experienced or we know family members or friends who expected sympathy uh, from their colleagues and other friends, but were instead treated with suspicion and even frostiness. The Palestinian suffering was uppermost in their minds. Sometimes younger members of our own families 
seem more concerned about Palestinian suffering than Israel's right to self-defense. Anti-Zionism amongst Jews, especially in Gen Z, where it is rampant, is very painful and very divisive for those families and a big subject in itself, which I won't get into. Uh, the second is institutional. There is a shock of rejection and hostility by institutions, particularly universities displaying double standards of tolerance. They have none for any negative expression toward officially oppressed or racialized students, but virtually any negative expression is tolerated uh, or held to be contextual under the rubric of freedom of expression if directed toward Israel and Jews. Appeasement and enablement have been common amongst university leaders toward encampments, disruptions, intimidation, harassment, and vandalism. But other institutions have piled on as well. School boards, unions, businesses like Paramount Foods, whose owner publicly announced he would prefer Jews not to patronize his multiple restaurants. Uh, the Toronto District School Board, as you heard, took students on a field trip supposedly about indigenous problems with mercury contamination, which turned out to include pro a protest featuring anti-Israel elements that the kids participated in without parental knowledge or consent. Three, the media. The mainstream media, apart from uh, the National Post and other post-media papers and a few tabloids in Canada, have been equivocal or anti-Israel in their coverage of events. The CBC has been simply rotten through and through. Honest reporting fact checks them on a daily basis, but they don't care. They've staked out a highly ideological anti-Zionist position that has the effect, if not the intent, of encouraging anti-Semitism. Additionally, there is a profound imbalance in foreign media coverage of Israel and the Arab world. Israel, with all its internal quarrels, is open to scrutiny for the foreign press, including their far-right rants uh, from certain members of the government, while Gaza and Hezbollah, uh, Hezbollah dominated Lebanon, Syria, Iran, and Yemen control their media and punish anyone who strays uh, from their party line. So the scale of violence in these places is suppressed, whereas every angry criticism of Netanyahu is blown out of proportion. And despite obvious evidence that these countries cannot be trusted as reliable sources, Western media play along with them as if they were. You don't see armed Hamas terrorists in photos from Gaza, but you do see a lot of dead children or dolls made to seem like dead children. You see mourning families, families in grief, uh, and chaotic hospital scenes. You don't see bomb shelters because there are none, despite the fact that tunnels make perfect bomb shelters, and Gaza has more miles of tunnels than the London Underground. The tunnels, of course, are only for Hamas combatants. Nobody ever comments on that in the media. Nobody comments on the fact that Gazans are not allowed to speak freely to Western reporters. The boundary line between news and opinion has largely disappeared in many news outlets, conspicuously so in the BBC and the CBC, uh, which are public broadcasters, and sadly, all too frequently, even in such authoritative outlets as the New York Times. Too much journalism today is predicated on a preconception that is ideologically colored. The Gaza Ministry of Health is a wing of a terror organization, but how many readers know that? Few. Finally, governments. Several layers of government, which at the local level has been slow to enforce the law against insightful protesters or crack down on those who cross lines from speech to action, and at the higher levels is silent, uh, tepid, or equivocal in their denunciations of anti-Semitism. Our community feels extremely vulnerable, in short, because we do not see the kind of concern we deserve for our legitimate distress or the commitment to action at the very highest level to deal with or even recognize as distinct from Islamophobia or homophobia or transphobia uh, the virulence, the special virulence of anti-Semitism as compared to other forms of big bigotry. When the leader of your country fails to lead on anti-Semitism, uh, it, is, it is rational that Jews should feel a special dread. Uh, in Israel, of course, uh, the, it, there are commonalities and differences. Uh, people in Israel were in shock on October 7th, obviously, regarding the inability of the defense and intelligence establishments to prevent such a barbaric attack in the first place. They were stunned that the security forces did not respond quickly. 
Uh, they were appalled at the explosion of anti-Semitism and pro-mass murder sentiment on campuses and streets in the West and in the media. Most did not fully understand uh, that in America, Canada, and other nice countries that, uh, nice countries, that Israelis love to visit uh, the new anti-Semitism, uh, I'm talking about left-wing anti-Semitism, not the Nazi kind that they're all very familiar with, that has been brewing in academic circles, has been spilling out into the mainstream. Because of this realization, many progressive Israelis have become embittered and disillusioned with progressivism in its intersectional, anti-racist form. So in sum, I would say that October 7th made Israelis realize or maybe reminded them of how deep anti-Jewish hate runs even in modern liberal democracies. Our enemies are everywhere. Society can turn on us very quickly indeed. Uh, these realizations uh, have, uh, have boosted a sense of, if, if something good can be said to have come out of it, it did boost solidarity and a sense of a shared future and fate between Israelis and diaspora Jews. That being said, there are obvious differences. Uh, Jewish communities here are on the receiving end of the pro-Hamas, pro-mass murder sentiment of the dismantle Israel ideology and protests. Uh, in Israel, they only see that on the news. They don't viscerally experience uh, this particular form of anti-Semitism. They don't have to watch what they say in public. They don't have to think twice about wearing a Magen David necklace. And in this regard, uh, Israelis are psychologically safer in, in a certain sense. The hate so freely directed at Jews in the West does not affect most of them face to face they only have to deal with actual terror attacks and the war. Um, so the bottom line is all of us have deep fears coming from different directions. Israelis are better equipped to deal with theirs because they have agency uh, within their own country and we are dependent on the kindnesses of strangers in a sense for our safety and our rights. Uh, so I'll just, um, I'll close there because I know there's lots to cover. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, and, and thank you for including me, David. Um, I, I think Barbara gave a very good um, sort of uh, high-level overview of the kind of threats that, uh, that Jews face uh, after October 7th. My work in studying anti-Semitism is, is a little bit different because as a journalist, I tend to look at case studies. I tend to look at subcultures. And in that study, what I found is that the kind of anti-Semitism you see, and that's not always even the right word, is maybe very different from what we expect. So uh, there was a some of you may be familiar with a, a scholar named, uh, I think, believe his name is Norman Cohn. Uh, wrote a fantastic book uh, called Warrant for Genocide, which was about the protocols of the elders of Zion. And he talked about how that infamous anti-Semitic hoax became created in the late 19th century by czarist Russians, and how it came to be influential in, in Europe, and, and most tragically uh, came to, to influence uh, Hitler and uh, laid the seeds for the the Holocaust. The point he makes in that book is that the reason the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was so effective is because it was reading back to people anti folk anti-Semitism that they had, had learned at their grandparents' knee, that anti-Semitism was already a widespread, deep-seated, murderous creed that had already been pogroms all over Eastern Europe. And like all good, or I should say all effective, hate propaganda, it read back to people things they already thought they knew because anti-Semitism was already a deep-seated creed at that time. To be honest, I do not see that kind of anti-Semitism at play in the subcultures I study. And I'm just going to pause. I'm just going to grab some water. Over here. Um, so, for instance, I study radicalized anti-Zionism, which often blurs into anti-Semitism in things like uh, the Canadian activist community or the Canadian literary community 
or um, lately, I, I've just written a big article, I know it's hopelessly obscure, but I thought it was informative, uh, in, the, in, the, in the board gaming community. I don't know if anyone here read that. <laughs> but what's really interesting is, in many ways, and it, these are radicalized anti-Zionist spaces, um, and I know that because sometimes I assume fake identities and I go on their Discord servers and I'm, I'm not proud, but you know, this is what journalists do, you know, so I have an avatar with like, you know, the watermelon and the three masks and the <laughs> bl blue hair and, um, uh, and, and, but I, you know, I don't try not to stir the pot, that would be irresponsible. Uh, I, but I, I just kind of listen to what they say and the reason I was studying this is because Again, it's hopelessly obscure, but these subcultures are really informative. You know, if you want to know how woke anti-Semitism, so to speak, flourishes, I think sometimes it pays to like put down the megaphone and just kind of listen and, and enter these spaces and not scream in people's faces and see like, because these personality types often fall into clusters. And what you see in the board gaming space, I know it's obscure, but it's, it's so radicalized because there's a group within the board gaming space that has tried to boycott not one but two board gaming conventions because they weren't explicitly anti-Zionist. So one was called Gen Con, which was in Indianapolis, and the organizers told them they could absolutely go screw themselves and we're not banning Zionists from our convention, please go away. But then what was interesting is these anti-Zionist activists targeted a much smaller convention known as Big Bad Con, which is in Oakland. I know this is, people are like, I, <laughs> I woke up early to hear this. But it's, um, it's, it's important because Big Bad Con was explicitly created as a social justice board gaming space. And as a result, and this often happens, this is a common pattern. This is why the anti-Zionists target museums, they target universities, they target theater groups. They target already ultra-left spaces that they know they can bully because they know that the currency of moral virtue in these spaces is oppression. And the product they're selling is oppression. They're saying, well, you know, you're on the side of Turtle Island and First Nations and Grassy Narrows and rainbows and unicorns and gender bending and Black Lives Matter and well, if you like that, you'll love this. Look, you know, it's, it's uh, the Palestinians, they're, they're being oppressed. And just as David said, it's the rubric of oppressed versus oppressor. And people are like, okay, sounds, sounds reasonable. Um, and as we know, social media in these spaces means it's very easy to homogenize viewpoints. You know, back like 50 years ago, You'd get, it's like Jews, you'd get 10 leftists in a room and they'd have 10 different opinions about Israel or, or other things. You know, there were movements that would sweep these, uh, these political uh, subcultures, but it was easier to have different views. Now, because Twitter and other social media are so effective as an enforcement mechanism for dominant personalities within these spaces to enforce monocultures, you get, and this has happened in the board game space, six or seven extreme anti-Zionists who act as ideological enforcers. And I see this in the Discord servers. Discord is like what gamers use to talk to each other and exchange, it's like Skype, but for nerds. And they, they, there aren't that many people who are radicalized anti-Zionists, but they have taken the commanding heights of discourse and have used it to essentially bully anybody who doesn't believe what they say. And, I'll be honest, even in these ultra-Zionist spaces, and this is the most anti-Zionist anti -Zionist space that I have encountered in my journalism, like it's, it's really crazy stuff. Um, I get the sense 90% of the people don't really care that much, but just they wanna go to this board game convention and not get like red paint poured on them, so they're like, sure, uh, down with the Jewish state. Like, can I play games now? And I, like to do a close study of like who are the enforcers, who are the ideologues. Often they're Jewish. In the board gaming space, the top social justice enforcer right now is a woman named Esther. And they all go by one name, by the way. They're, they're all because it's like this Dungeons and Dragons thing. And she, you know, of course, it's like the masks and uh, unpronounceable pronouns. Um, you know, very proudly says she's Jewish, Muslim, Arab, partner, she's very quick to caution everybody, 
um, anti-police, Black Lives Matter, like go down the list. It's a whole, like the whole suite, these things come as a package deal now. And she's the one who's most militantly pushing to literally ban Zionists from board gaming meetings. And the organizers of the conference said, look, we're a 501c3 organization. David, you know about this. We can't, we can't tell Jews they can't show up. Oops, sorry, I mean Zionists. Um, but this isn't, when I look at, let's look at the discourse, this isn't really anti-Semitism of the kind that, like, I, you know, I, I wrote a book about conspiracy theories. I interviewed real anti-Semites, like the kind who, you know, wouldn't touch me because I'm Jewish. These people aren't in that category. What they are are prestige seekers within a rigidly policed ideological climate where ideological enforcers have convinced them, often successfully, like often it's not an act, that Israel is a colonial state, that the Palestinians are like Turtle Island. They will say to me with a straight face that Gaza is like this LGBT paradise where everyone has four genders. Like, I mean, they, they kind of believe it because it eliminates cognitive dissonance because in a highly tribalized world, there's the oppressed and the oppressor. And you've heard the slogan, no one is free until everyone is free. So it, it invites the conceit that every oppressed minority is kind of like on the same team. And so if you go to Gaza, you're gonna meet, it's like A, they're indigenous, and I don't wanna get into the whole nonsense about like who's indigenous to Israel, because there's, I'll offend the Babylonians and the Hittites and the, <laughs> the, the Phoenicians, but it's indigenous. It, well, I'm in favor of trans stuff, so I guess they must be kind of trans. Um, is, there's a class thing. It's a color thing because it's like Israel is white or white adjacent and Gaza, it's more brown. So like it fits into all these paradigms. And so then, you know, you've seen these videos like from the river to the sea. And then like <laughs> some guy like me says, what river, what sea? And they're like, oh, I'll get back to you. They don't know. <laughs> but what they do know is that in their ecosystem, this kind of rhetoric is rewarded. And especially if you're a Jew, because if you're a Jew like Esther, it's, this has so many unfortunate Purim overtones, but that is the name she goes by on Twitter, and you could look at it. I'm blocked, but some of you may not be. Um, like, she weaponizes her Judaism, and she gets extra points because she's like, well, I'm Jewish, and I still hate Israel. And to be fair, both sides do this. Like, the best way to be a, a keynote speaker at a Jewish conference is to be like a Muslim who, who hates Hamas, right? Like, th this is how people get invited to conferences. And, you do, we assign them extra credibility. When the son of the founder of Hamas goes on TV, he gets extra credibility when he denounces Hamas because of who he is. But this happens on the other side. And a lot of it is a kind of displaced uh, dealing with their privilege. So a lot of these people are downwardly mobile, heavily depressed, status seekers, um, don't have a lot of money, they're in this nerd space, all they have is their prestige, all they have is their status as hardcore soldiers on behalf of the oppressed people of the world. And someone said, we're gonna give you a hero cookie if you wear a watermelon shirt and put a watermelon an emoji and show up at Berkeley on Saturday morning and scream down with the settler Zionist Jewish state. And they're like, all right. And they internalize that. This is where I disappoint audiences like this. It's not real anti-Semitism in the sense that our grandparents, and maybe our parents, and maybe some of us, have experienced in our real life in terms of meeting people who actually hate Jews. When I'm on these social media platforms, actual anti-Semitism is heavily stigmatized. Anti-Semitism of the form of like what the Jew wants or what the Jew, that kind of stuff, they, they actually, even in these hardcore social justice spaces, Unless you're talking maybe about Arabic language stuff and like, which I haven't gone that deep into my, you know, deep <laughs> penetration operation, haven't learned the language skills. In the English language, academic, activist, journalistic um, subcultures, it's not real anti-Semitism. It manifests often as, as real anti-Semitism, but it's not the kind of anti-Semitism I think our grandparents would recognize. And I think if you want to fight it, Conferences like this are nice, but it has to be stigmatized within those ecosystems, within university faculty meetings, um, within activist circles, at the TDSB, at board game conventions, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I 
later this week when you go to your board game convention, you must be the conscience in the room. Um, and so in, in a weird way, like I'm kind of hopeful because I see this as not for everybody. I mean, you do mean some hard, like anyone know Fred Hahn? I mean, you, you meet some like, okay, people who are beyond redemption. But 90% of the people that I've seen who are the most militant anti-Zionists in these spaces, five years from now, they're going to be talking about something else. They really are. And it doesn't mean they're not doing damage. It doesn't mean that they're not disgusting to listen to. Um, but it does give me hope that this too shall pass. So that's my view. Thank you. A lot of food for thought. By the way, I was supposed to have the video that <clears throat> the great Natan Sharansky recorded spe specifically for this gathering in the very beginning. So we're going to do it right after this session. Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've been following what goes on both in the U.S. and Canada. And um, a, a couple months ago, I, I caught wind of this anti-Palestinian racism trend that had been officially adopted by the Toronto School District. Um, I told my team uh, in the U.S. to pay attention to it because we used to say this about California, whatever starts in Toronto ends up, you know, everywhere else, you know, and, um, and I, n now, of course, and it was within two weeks, by the way, we started to see anti-Palestinian racism in the sort of American uh, pediatric association and then at a DEI training at, uh, at a major university and so forth. And I want to sort of um, I want to sort of, so I, I'm saying that because I think it's important to understand that what the U.S. and Canada are not that distinct in a sense. I think we're, we're, we're experiencing similar phenomena, but just in, in slightly different contexts. The dynamics of race are a little different in, in each place. Um, a, a few weeks ago, um, the director of the Hillel, the Center for Student Life at Columbia University, at the invitation of the Columbia administration, was giving a talk about the plight of Jewish students at Columbia. And while that was happening, four deans at Columbia, the Dean of Student Affairs, were texting each other saying, can you believe how privileged these Jewish kids are? Now, how do we know this? Because somebody very smart in the audience was taking pictures of their texting. And then, and then members of Congress uh, asked for the official um, transcript. And, and so we, we were able to see this in real time. And you could, it's, it's almost hard, to let that sink in for a second. If that's happening among these four top deans, imagine what the discourse is there. Imagine what it must be at other similar institutions of higher education. And I guess the question is, and um, you know, why, what unleashed this? What do you think unleashed this? Maybe I'll start with you, Barbara. And, and I also want to ask, is John right that this is like a passing transient thing? Or is this sort of more deep-seated, and are we in for a lot longer than five years? I, I'm going to start with uh, start with your oh, last question. Way, just to clarify, I'm not saying the opposite. Anti-Semitism is a passing thing. It's no, no. The, you know, the most successful ideology of the, the no, 20th no, no, century. No, no, no. I don't think I, I I disagree that this particular phase. I think we're still in the ascendant phase. I don't think we've seen. Uh, I think it's it, it's ramping up. It's not, it's not decreasing, it's escalating. It's been encouraged tacitly or otherwise uh, by the institutions that I mentioned and the media. Um, and I, I see it getting worse, not better. So, uh, sorry, what was the first part? <laughs> uh, why, why, why now? Why, are we real, why did this emerge? I mean, you would think that October 7th would have sort of tampered it down a bit, but it actually did the opposite. No, it's, uh, it started with Durban when uh, all the ideology in the universities burst out into the public forum. Uh, the UN, by the way, is, is a, a conduit, uh, an absolute conduit for the most fierce and disgusting uh, anti-Semitism. So the entire world is infected with this, um, and it's become uh, the omni-cause of all these other uh, racism, everything else, uh, so that it's, it's a mind virus, uh, you know, Gad Saad calls it a, a mind virus. Uh, I call it a sort of a, a kind of pathological altruism for this cause that has been ginned up. Uh, they've been very busy for the last 25 years uh, infecting the faculties and the academy and all of that. So it's gonna get, I think, 
much worse. And, and when, when I say the omni-cause, I mean at, at the heart of this matrix uh, is the Palestinian cause. Uh, and anti-Palestinian racism is a thing, an invented thing, because how would you know if, if someone is a Palestinian or, 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 or a Syrian? You wouldn't know because there's no distinction between them in terms of language or ethnicity or anything else. So, uh, you know, Hadley Freeman, the journalist, calls this the fat bird of causes, and everything else revolves around it, and, and people don't even realize. I just want to give you one example, and, and I, the Guardian newspaper, um, like, all of a sudden we were seeing Greta Thunberg. Now, she's an environmentalist, right, from the day she was born. She never studied anything else. She doesn't know anything else. She's a single-minded, you know, uh, person who's, who, who knows nothing but environment. Suddenly she's wearing a keffiyeh and holding up her fist and holding a little octopus, which is a symbol of the of, of a blind libel of the Jews that have their, you know, their, their claws and everything. And I'm asking myself, how does Greta Thunberg suddenly become an anti-Palestinian, uh, a pro-Palestinian activist, a Hamas supporter? So The Guardian, in January 2024, wrote an article. And in it, they described the environmental, the environmental damage done by Israel in its response to this war. They noted, they noted that 60 days of Israeli military activity used, used 150,000 tons, T-O-N-N-E-S, tons of coal, whereas Hamas rockets only, only used 713 tons of COT, CO2, produced CO2. So, Ask yourself if this is something that's going to blow over or if it's going to suck in every cause in the world. Um, there is something perverse and weird. Has any in the history of military, the entire history of warfare, has anybody ever before remarked on the environmental? Oh, I'm sorry, 2018 when Hamas burnt 10,000 tires at the border, 10,000 rubber tires at the border with Israel the environmental damage was severe. Nobody ever mentioned the environmental factor, never. So that, to me, tells, tells me that this is uh, a phenomenon like nothing the world has ever seen before. I guess the question is, it sounds like Barbara is arguing that anti-Semitism is the core ideology. You might be arguing that, at least in this context, that radical social justice ideology is the, is the core ideology. How do you respond? Uh, so I mean, look, obviously there's anti-Semitism in the world, and obviously it does seem pathological when one country is singled out in this way. Um, like, I'm not going to dispute that. Um, but I, yeah, I do see a lot of this as deflected uh, social justice, deflected Marxism. Like, in terms of The Guardian, I mean, that, that Guardian article does sound kind of stupid, but like, all these people posting TikTok videos, like, they're not reading The Guardian. They're, it, it's it's a, they're status seekers within an ideological movement, and they've been, as I said, they've been told that this, this, this is how they're going to promote themselves. Oh, yeah, and, and they don't get their news from The Guardian. They get their news from TikTok and from YouTube, and yeah, a lot of these videos are doctored. We've all seen these propaganda videos, and it's true that there is like a symbiosis between the mainstream media and uh, social media, but like I, I know a lot of people who spend a lot of time like debunking a story they see in a British newspaper or, oh my God, the New York Times ran this and let's look at the 17 reasons the New York. I, I'm not sure how helpful that is because people are adopting this as a, a posture. Uh, I'm not saying it's superficial, they internalize it and sometimes again, they do real damage. Um, but sometimes the language used, and I think Barbara is, is, is apoc apocalyptic. And I'm not sure that's helpful because the other side's language is apocalyptic too, it's right. Like from, from, from Turtle Island to Palestine, the world will be cleansed of oppressors. And like you start to listen to it and it's like super creepy ethnic cleansing stuff. And I, I find the, the best way to deal with it and analyze it, and sometimes maybe once in a blue moon convince people is to kind of like ratchet things down and say, all right, let's kind of look at some of the analogies you're using, like you know, ex, you know Black Lives Matter, extrapolating from that to Israel or extrapolating from in, in, I mean, Greta is an extremely disturbed individual. Um, I can't watch a video of her without like saying, oh my God, her parents must be mortified. But, um, which like, it shows my age, right? Because like 10 years ago, I wouldn't have had that response. But she has an iconoclastic anger show. 
Yeah. <laughs> but, but one, like, I guess, one thing is a lot of these people thrive on anger. Like, they're really angry, and when people get angry with them, it gives them the drama they want. They want to see themselves as protagonists in an existential struggle for the soul of, of, the, of civilization. And it is weird the way they decided this little patch of real estate in the Middle East is like the keystone of that struggle. However, when you respond in kind, and I know conservatives who are like, this is existential, this is the future of, what happens in Israel is this takes the future of the West, I'm like, that is not helping. You're just reading back the apocalyptic reveries of the left, but in your own viewpoint. And the best, often, the reason I'm a satirist on social media is that's the thing which often gets people to think the most. Instead of flipping their apocalypticism on its head, which just makes them happy because it's like, oh, it's true, we are fighting an apocalyptic struggle, good versus evil, and I'm, I'm on the good side and they're on the evil side, but they don't realize it. They say, I'm evil. You know, this, <laughs> this essay will convince them otherwise. Like, I'm just kind of like, what are you doing? Like, look at you, you're just this overprivileged seventh year art student who's doing cosplay <laughs> activism and you're guilty because your parents gave you a trust fund and now you don't want to give up your own money, so instead you're gonna play with house money by talking about stuff on the other side of the world. Isn't that what's happening? They're like, no, that's not what's happening. It's kind of what's happening. And, <laughs> and, and again, it's not like, you know, you, there's a, a come to Jesus moment. Uh, but over time, I find that's just kind of more effective is to put things in context and look at the actual motivations of the people doing this. And not, I, again, I don't think it's helpful to confuse it with what I call like anti-Semitism of the blood. You know, people, old style Nazi anti-Semitism that regarded Jews as pathogens Jews are the most exalted members of the anti-Zionist movement. I, Naomi Klein could sashay into any encampment and she'd be feted as like Joan of Arc. I mean, they love Naomi Klein and she's more Jewish than me. Right, uh, but I, I, have a, I have a question though. Um, you know, people write essays and they may be better or worse. You, you can be a great satirist as you are on, on Twitter and else, elsewhere, but you know, there's a movement of people that are showing up in encampments that are um, pushing students to you know, dress up as colonizers for protests. Doesn't that require politics? And doesn't politics require organization? And doesn't organization require some level of outrage that, uh, among people like us to go out there and say, look, we're gonna fight this. We don't, you may be right, Kay, yeah. but, um, but we're, we're worried you're wrong. And we're worried that we better fight this now or we're going to be stuck with this in Canada. It might not be such a pleasant place You're to right live. in one very, very important way, which is you need an institutional community response to give backbone. I wouldn't, I'm not even sure politics is the right term, but institutional administrative backbone. Because University of Toronto is a very good example. And I know there's at least one University of Toronto professor here. Uh, I'm not going to out them. But <laughs> when the University of Toronto eventually asked the police to take down the encampment, which actually had become, like there were some genuinely anti-Semitic incidents there, the police said to them, really? Trespass? Well, for a couple months, you were kind of like cool with the encampment. It was like freedom of speech, and now you're saying it's trespass? Sorry. And I remember I was upset at the time that the Toronto police weren't doing anything, but I kind of saw their point, which is that the university administrators wanted to have it both ways. They, they, they wanted order on the campus, they wanted to maintain authority, but they also wanted the moral authority that came with putting down stakes, at least in some way, with the anti-oppressive forces. And you had people in the Jewish community who, who did rally, and including many people in this room, and as a result, gave the University of Toronto backbone. And, and so when the summer was over, and people started to come say, okay, time to set up our new encampment, the university was like, absolutely not, and we're putting you on notice, and the first second you set up your stupid tent, we're, we're calling a trespass and the police are coming in and universities all across North America did that. And they did that in large part of, because of an institutional response and that was helpful. But it was helpful in a practical way. It wasn't helpful in terms of like, we're gonna win the, the war of civilizations with rhetoric. It was helpful in like a very practical brass tacks way of saying, hey look, Jewish kids should be able to walk to class with some idiot screaming in their face about how they have to renounce their privilege. Like that's just not cool. And I think that to me is an example of David where you're absolutely right, where institutional response is necessary and effective. But that's on a procedural, physical space level. I, I'm not sure how effective that approach is on like, you know, you see these people debating on Twitter, it's like Jews are indigenous to, to, to Israel. 
no Palestinians are indigenous of Israel, disgust. And it's like, <laughs> that kind of argument is like, when I see it, I'm like, oh my God, these people are both wasting their time. That to me is ridiculous. But I like the more practical solution. Got it. Barbara, I just want to ask you a little bit more. You know, you, you, you outlined the threats facing the Jewish community quite eloquently, and you've been doing that for many years. But, aren't, but what about the, uh, this ideology? What is its relationship to what you spoke about, the, this oppressor-oppressor ideology or whatever we decide to, to call it? Well, the, you know, the oppressed oppressor, this Marxist, uh, who is doing what to whom? You know, this Leninist question uh, is what... Students are being not taught facts. They're being taught to have a certain attitude. And the attitude comes down to that question that Lenin famously posed. Who is doing what to whom? If the powerless are doing something horrible to the powerful, if even if it's atrocities, rape, murder, and burning babies alive, you may call it resistance. If the powerful are insulting somebody at a checkpoint and making them wait for half an hour, you may call it terrorism. So words mean nothing. Attitude means everything. And the problem is that those ranked amongst the oppressed are everybody else. Gender, race, uh, ethnicity, uh, other religions than Judaism, you name it, actually Judaism, they don't care about Judaism as a religion, so I should put that apart. But um, everybody else is on the oppressed side. The Jews are always ranked amongst the oppressors. They are hyper white, not only white, hyper white. It doesn't matter that half of Israel is brown, it doesn't matter that half of Israel is indistinguishable in appearance from Arabs. They don't want to know about that because evidence, facts, and the actual dictionary meanings of words are irrelevant to them. It is the formation of an approach, an attitude that they are inculcating in young people. And the trouble with Jews is, the trouble with Jews, the trouble with Jews is that we have staked everything on our ability to make a case. And we make the case with facts and evidence, and you know, this whole Talmudic lineage that we have of people arguing with each other over, you know, is my interpretation correct or is your interpretation, let's look at the text. You know, words are important to us, but they are, and their meanings are important to us, but they are not important. And that's why when people, you know, say, how can you say you're a queer for Palestine? Don't you know what goes on? They would throw you off a roof and they look at you like, who are you? Get out of my way. Like, you know, I'm, how do you like my kafia? Like it's, it's they, because they, they don't care what goes on in Palestine. They, they, have, in, they have learned the, the mantra. If it's the Jews, then, the, and they're the powerful, and, and Hamas are the powerless, they, the Palestinians are the powerless. They've learned that. That's all they need to know. So of course they're for Palestine. Of course it's queers for Palestine, and it's environmentalists for Palestine, and blacks for Palestine. And that's how, that's, and, and we don't have any other tools, by the way. We, we do not have, Jews are very good at arguing. We're very good at debate. We're very good at writing essays. We're very good at all kinds of things, but we don't believe in violence. We don't believe in actually doing what other people would like to do to us and threaten to do to us and sometimes do do to us. So this is our problem. We are magnificent with words. Nobody's interested in our words. That's so, the problem. So that's the problem. So tell us, what do you, we, we heard from John on this just a second ago about what he thinks we ought to do about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. What do you think collectively we can do about it? Well, I think uh, lawsuits are a good way to start. And I think uh, some lawsuits are in progress right now that are going to succeed. I, I do believe in, it, it, you know, as long as the courts are still objective and how long that will be, as some of them are not, as we know, because we have law students that are as woke as anybody else. They are our future uh, lawyers and judges uh, and prosecutors. So uh, I don't think we have much time to get these lawsuits done. And, 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 and some of them are, have been very effective. Lawsuits are one thing. Um, 
Uh, money is another. We've seen some of very important millionaires like Bill Ackman, who's, uh, you know, they've withdrawn their millions of dollars of support. But that's not going to work on universities that have $50 billion endowments. I mean, it won't work for long. Uh, it, it sounds good for Twitter, and it sounds good for a time. But, but the money itself, they won't mind losing it if they have a big enough endowment. So that's, that's not going to work for long. It makes headlines. Uh, the w one thing that I can see succeeding, something happened last week that gave me hope. And I'm, it's, it's going to be the subject of my next column. Uh, and that was when uh, Dr. Uh, Arnie Aberman, uh, former dean of the medical school, yeah, he returned his honorary doctorate to the University of Toronto. I think that was the first time in the history of the University of Toronto that that had been done. If you cast your mind back to 2005, when uh, uh, the um, indigenous leader, David Ahenekew, uh went on a rant about how Hitler didn't finish the job, he should have fried six million more, like he was an extreme anti-Semite. Um, and of course, it was, it, back in those days, you could say those things and say, oh, there was no context here. That's pure anti-Semitism, and it was. So there was great consternation. Oh my God, but he's an indigenous person, and, um, you know, and, and, and there were people that supported him uh, amongst this community, so what are we gonna do about this? What are we gonna do about this? I wrote a column, and I said, it, it's no good, you know, uh, lambasting him and, and making him a martyr or taking him to court over this. He has to be asked to return his Order of Canada. It is a great honor to, re to receive the Order of Canada. And what people care about more than money is their status, their social status, and their prestige. And a couple of days later, um, maybe it was just a coincidence, uh, Peter Newman wrote a piece for Maclean's and said, I am not going to wear my Order of Canada pin until David Ahenekew's pin is returned. He could have said, I'm going to turn in my, you know, but he didn't, but that's okay. He said, I'm not going to wear it. And then a few other people said, yeah, I'm not going to wear my Order of Canada pin too. And David Ahenekew, his pin was taken away. And that was a great achievement because of, before that, I think there was only, uh, uh, the only person that ever had been asked was a sports, um, yes, uh, who had been asked because he was conv convicted of fraud. Um, anyways, that was, a, that was a high point. That was, that was a high point. He was also thrown out of our tennis club. Well, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> I think, I think that what Dr. Aberman did was fantastic. And I think that universities, they, they may regret losing those million dollar endowments, but they'll get over that. What they won't get over is if prominent Jews with prestige and who have had many honorary doctorates from these institutions, if they start turning them in and saying, I no longer want my name associated as having been honored by this institution because I think that would have more of a moral effect than any amount of money being withdrawn from, from uh, Thank you. We're almost out of time. John, any um, final thoughts? I, you know what, uh, I think Barbara's right. The, the grand gesture often helps. I kind of like the prosaic, banal back office gesture too. Uh, there's, you know, I think we've already, there's already been a shout out to uh, Michael Tepper, uh, uh, who's in this room. And this is a guy who I just learned is, is a tax lawyer. Um, I'm a former tax lawyer. Unlike me, he's, he's apparently quite good at it. And, and I remember it was like this super busy job. And he does, he finishes his tax law. And then like he spends the next six hours writing letters to the TDSB about their whack job teachers. Um, and he gets results. Like, and I know he gets results. <laughs> Did you actually stand up? Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. oh, Michael. <laughs> Michael, get over yourself. But I, <laughs> the real heroes are the journalists who amplify his work. But, <laughs> but, but I, you know, this is very unglamorous stuff. But to be honest, like, I kind of appreciate it more 
Because what Michael do, and I, I know he does this because he does it in his letters. Michael, to my knowledge, doesn't have the order of Canada. You know, he doesn't enjoy the baubles and vanities of professional dispensation. But what he does have is he a sense of fair play. And he says, you know, the TDSB, this is what it says in your, in your law. This is what it says in your enabling legislation. This is what you said, you know, your mission statement on your website. This is what your responsibilities are. And this is what your teacher's doing. There's a discrepancy. Fix that. And I know the TDSB folks grumble uh, and they black out half the, uh, you know, access information documents they send them. But at the end of the day, he gets results. And there's a small army of people doing, <coughs> doing this in the Jewish community. And they don't have the Order of Canada, but they're the people moving the needle. And um, I think that has to be done more, <laughs> more in, in subcultures that, dare I say, are hostile to us. Um, and and you know, I listed some of them, the Canadian literary scene, um, the Canadian theater scene. I mean, these are hope, hope, hopelessly obscure, but we see how it kind of burbles into the mainstream. Like that, we all remember the, uh, the crimes that took place outside Chapters Indigo, because it's owned by that, you know, history's greatest monster, Heather Reisman, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but what was incredible about that event is the academics, most of whom, if I remember, came from York, were kind of like, wait, you're arresting us? What's going on? Like, on campus, we, see, we do this stuff all the time. <laughs> and, and they couldn't kind of, like, get it into their head. And you saw the response on social media. It's like, whoa, just smash a few windows and suddenly people are arresting you? Like, what's going on? <laughs> this is social justice. This is direct action, folks. And the, the re what you saw was the insulation between their academic hothouse, where all this stuff is considered not just tolerated, but like <laughs> you get course credit for it. And then the real world of like Bloor and Bay, where people are like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm trying to buy a book here. Like, please stop you know, pouring paint on the sidewalk. And we have to break down that barrier. And that has to be from people within those communities. And I know, I know there's people in the room here who do that, again, it can't, I'm telling you maybe what you already know, is, um, and I've seen people do it, and I, unfortunately I've seen people pay the price, including the board game space where my informant in the board game space was a disaffected Jew who like showed me all the screenshots. And, and what was crazy about the screenshots is this person was parroting all that stuff. And I said, wait, well, you're, you're saying all this like crazy anti-Zionist stuff, what's going on? He says, yeah, I gotta do it. I wanna go to the board game convention. I don't want it to be awkward. It's like, okay. <laughs> And, but once there's one person like that, they send to a journalist. Two people like that, they look at each other, maybe we can do something. Five people like that, they have to look around the room and say, we gotta do something about that. And that, to me, that's the solution, is a call it um, the Tepper approach. You know, like it's, he's gonna have his own school of thought soon in terms of activism. So that's my view. Thank you. The the yeah, the yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you both. What do I, I'd love to be at a, Seder dinner and see what goes on there. But you absolutely would not. You, I know. You I know. absolutely. I that's the Seder I would never attend. It. Yeah. <laughs> right. The last Seder on earth. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I've heard. That was a setup. Um, well, it's gr a great setup for the rest of today because a lot of the, the ideas that you both articulated, I think, will come out in the conversation, particularly on academia and K through 12, and now also the law. So thank you both for for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And we're going to hear now from the great Natan Sharansky.